Hello everybody and a very warm welcome to this introduction and overview session in the certificate programs in Python for algorithmic trading and computational finance. My name is Eve. I'm your program director. I'm also founder of the Python Quants and the AI machine. It's always a special moment, special event that we kick off another cohort of our certificate programs. Always looking forward because we uh, uh, usually have some very exciting new stuff that we put into the mix. The program has grown over the years, but uh, we've never had a cohort where uh, the content and what we've covered has been the same as before. So we're always moving forward. We try to keep up. We try to put things um, into the mix that uh, was not there yet, but which might have become important over time. But we also have a couple of new things uh, during this program which you will have access to, in particular to update the materials, but more on that later on. Um, I've prepared here the slide deck and we should jump right into it. Uh, I have a little bit of a program for today, so without further ado, let us uh, go through the slides. I just recommend that you lean back and follow along. Um, you have access to all the resources that I'm going to use uh, today anyways later on on the Quant platform. That's the agenda, 16 points. Uh, after a quick introduction for those who do not know yet in detail what we do, uh, just a quick overview. Then the program itself um, on a rather high level, uh, we then get started with one of the most fundamental classes that we teach finance with Python. Tools and skills are important like in every other field. Python for Financial Data Science, that's a class that is based on my Python for Finance book. We then have the uh, yeah, optional classes, Python for Excel, Python for Databases, uh, two core technologies in the financial industry um, that uh, are maybe not too important for some of you, but maybe for others, this might be uh, one of the most interesting aspects. Then we have, of course, uh, the Artificial Intelligence in Finance class, Reinforcement Learning for Finance, uh, both of them, uh, to a large extent, based on my new book, AI and Finance, or I should rather say that the book AI and Finance is uh, based on materials uh, that were first developed for the AI and Finance class. So of course, this is like um, an ongoing interaction here in this context. Python for algorithmic trading is the core class for the ALGO certificate. Uh, I've put the case study in here because um, uh, yeah, the majority of the examples are taken from the Algo trading part, and uh, I have also um, yeah, two case studies, uh, two example Jupyter notebooks uh, from computational finance, but we cover uh, Python for computational finance then afterwards. And uh, of course, we go through the study plan. Of course, everybody has access to the updated study plan. This is your guide, this is so to say your map. I know for many of you, this might be just like a rough guide. Um, our program provides the flexibility um, to not maybe follow along like the, the full 12 weeks as they are written down in the plan. Some people take 24 weeks. Others say, well, I, I um, currently have a little bit more time at my disposal. I want to do it a bit faster. This is all possible, but uh, in any case, we will have a structured phase now, which goes over 12 weeks, and they are well documented in the study plan. Then we have uh, review questions, exercise, and test projects, um, basically on a weekly basis. Uh, starting next week, which allow you to test yourself, to review yeah, if you have understood the central notions that we have covered, uh, yeah, and to practice because Python for finance is a skill. It's not that much about know-how and knowledge. Of course, this is important, but you need to be able to do it. Just to read about it uh, is a little bit like reading a book about swimming, right? There must come the point where you jump into the pool and try it yourself, and this is uh, with programming, it's the same thing. Right. The user forum is there to help. So we have a pretty active user forum where you can post your technical questions. Everything is there in terms of like syntax highlighting, et cetera, that you can make use of in order to uh, uh, yeah, well document your, your technical problem. And usually we get back uh, relatively fast, pretty fast in this context. I want to conclude today with the importance of practice, what I mentioned already before a bit. Uh, you will notice that this is one of my uh, focal points, the, the practice part, not that much, uh, let's say, the, the theory part. It's, it's a pretty practical program and it's uh, designed for practice, but also 
Um, I know, of course, that we have many academics, researchers, professors, postgrads, PhD students as well. And for them, uh, the practice is the same thing, right? Uh, coding is not about writing a paper where you only have a few math equ equations and, and nicely formatted text. Coding, yeah, is about doing it and writing it down. And the Python interpreter will tell you whether it works or not. It's like playing a piece on a piano. If you if you hit the uh, the wrong keys, then it doesn't sound too good. If you hit the right keys, then it might make for a pleasant um, experience. Um, there's already a question with regard to when AI uh, for finance will be available for purchase. This will be at the end of the year. But you have access to my current state of the book, AI in finance, as the HTML rendering. And that's the latest version. It's even later uh, with a few updates as compared to the version that went to the tech review. So um, you are among the first uh, who, are, who are getting access, not only to the, the text, but also to the codes, right? So there's like uh, for every, for every um, uh, chapter, there's at least one notebook with all the codes and uh, like technical appendices. So it's, it's all there. It's all there for you uh, already uh, to use and to benefit from, right? So quick introduction. Python quants, uh, I'm pretty sure you have done uh, your research. Uh, for all the others, uh, maybe that might later listen uh, to this um, uh, session there. Python for finance is uh, what we live and breathe and do on a daily basis. For me, it feels like a 24-7 topic. Um, uh, not that I don't do anything else. Of course, there's family and doing sports, but it's really what I live. We provide services. We, we do the training, the platform uh, that we run. And today is also kind of like a new element. You uh, will for the first time see our new platform. You will, for this cohort, it's the first cohort ever have access to our PQP 2.0, and uh, you will have uh, this access alongside the uh, original platform, right? Uh, we have open source packages. We, uh, I've written a couple of books, uh, provide certification, and of course we run events. And these days, of course, we run virtual events. I, I personally uh, organize six meetup groups. And uh, if there is a benefit to the current situation, then that we can, for example, do cross meetup group events um, virtually for all the groups at the same time. Uh, yeah, the AI machine is the second company here. A team in India is working on our algo trading platform. And uh, yeah, it's an ongoing project. We do since quite a while live trading. We are still updating stuff and, and doing improvements. So algo trading, if you want to do it on that level, is kind of a bit involved. Uh, pretty interesting. You will see more during the program there as well. That's the quick take. You have decided already, but that's one one page summary. If you if you forgot why why you signed up, here is your your uh, reference. It's the one pager which explains it. Here, the long version of what I've been doing. Um, feel free to read through it or to skip over it. Here are the books, Python and AI for Finance. Python for Finance, uh, pretty happy and excited uh, that I'm able to say this, that, it's, that it has become a reference work, not only in practice, on the practical side, but also in academia. There are many, many master classes that are taught based on my book because uh, programming itself, um, didn't play that much of a role like let's say 10, 10 20 years ago in master of finance and financial engineering programs it started slowly but these days there is no way around it anymore right you need to know the skill right? and uh, this is reflected in the curriculus of the uh, universities and my book has fortunately become kind of a, um, a reference there second edition came out in 2018 and this is the next one artificial intelligence and finance python based guide i, I talked about this already um this will be available um, according to plan. <laughs> Fingers crossed uh, towards the end of the year. It's currently in technical review. The, the, uh, it's not the next book project. There's a book project in parallel. Uh, this is uh, to, the one to which you have access as well, Python for algorithmic trading. This, these are the materials that we use since years already as a base for the algorithmic trading class. And uh, now it will come out also as a... As a book and uh, obviously i'm updating and revising it currently so you will have access here also to the new version so for this cohort uh, i'm happy that we have uh, basically only updated materials here in the in the core classes uh, in this regard 
So the quant finance books, this is uh, only relevant in particular the left one uh, for the computation finance part. This doesn't really play a role in the algo trading part, but uh, for computation finance, the blue one is uh, the basis. Um, besides the DX analytics as our open source package, which is covered there in detail as well. So the program itself, uh, I told you it, it has grown over the years and again, uh, to say that I'm really excited that we are adding as we go. And these are old numbers. Basically, you get access to, to much, much more than you see here on in the overview or in this overview. Um, there is stuff coming on top and on top. And then we try our best to provide you with the most comprehensive experience for this particular topic. So we, we love to be a niche player in that sense that we focus on Python for finance. But I think if you're focusing on such a niche, you should like, try to strive for a comprehensive offering. And this is what we do there. And, and uh, the program reflects what we have been doing over the years, what we plan to do, but it's also kind of the basis for everything else that we do around that, like the consulting work or um, building DI machines, or all that stuff like rests is based on uh, the, the contents, the skill, the, the know-how that we have built over the years based on this program, which is at the core of the core. And why Python for finance here? Yeah. But these are a couple of, and, and I could have put in here like a, a whole slide presentation, I could have uh, set up and compiled with just like these articles um, that say, well, these days, if you want to work in the financial industry in a somewhat quantitative role, there's no way around coding, right? Programming. And here, this article is about JP Morgan Chase. And I said, well, requirement for new stuff, coding lessons. So, and it's not from like yesterday, January or February, 2020. It's already from 2018, and uh, the banks have been usually a little bit late compared to the buy side. And if you started working for price in 2015 or 2010 already, they uh, big hedge funds, they already required you to have the skill. And, and this obviously hasn't changed. And of course, I'm always happy to see here that the coding uh, training for this year's juniors, 2018, was based on Python programming. That's the one thing which will help them to analyze very large data sets. And next year, this was the plan at least, uh, the asset management division will expand the mandatory tech training to include data science con uh, concepts, machine learning, and cloud computing. All stuff that we cover. So um, I'm not afraid of what, what they, they expect from um, a well-trained uh, uh, Python coder, Python quant in this regard. I think we have covered the bases there uh, pretty much in this regard. There's another one that's a little bit uh, later from mid-June um, 2019. Last year, of the year ago, uh, here graduates with tech and finance skills in high demand. So this is now how the market reacts. Well, we need people who know not only about finance and who know what a stock is, how FX trading works. No, no, no. Computer programming skills are becoming a must have. Uh, don't bother putting Excel or PowerPoint on your resume. Financial institutions are looking for R, Python, or another programming language. So this is like, not that you say, well, if I want to advance my career, Actually, it's, it's like a requirement to get started with a career in the first place, right? Things have changed here quite a bit. And then there comes the AI part, uh, another article. This is um, a bit later, 2019. Finance will need people who can work with robots as AI takes a third of jobs. So the, the, the advent of AI machine learning is, is omnipresent. Uh, you see it in so many different areas. And I doubt that. Let's say almost everybody in the industry will be replaced by machines anytime soon. But what is, of course, in demand is not only people that uh, can maybe process a bit of data, uh, but that are also able to handle yeah, modern technology, modern algorithms uh, from AI in general. So AI for me is always like um, the term that I use for machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning, whatever kind of like the, um, uh, the specific algorithm might be. Um, so you cannot simply close your eyes and say, well, I'm not kind of like impacted by that. It's there. <laughs> it's there to stay. It will never go away. The industry has already changed. So this is the base class, Finance with Python. Um, 
And to be frank, this is one of my favorite ones. So when I started writing that, um, I was kind of motivated by so many people who reached out to us and said, well, if your, your classes are all wonderful, but they, the entry level is already a little bit high, right? So I had finance, I don't know, 15 years ago at college, or uh, I did some programming 10 years ago on my job, but this is all rusty. I, you know, I need like a refresher. Do you have a good recommendation? And then I tried to come up with, yeah, proper sources, resources where people say, well, I start reviewing the basics. And finally, I said, well, obviously, this is a problem that more people face, not one, two, three. And I started writing finance with Python, which is a brief book compared to my other books. It has like the new PDF version, which I compiled, I think, on the weekend. So it's also an updated uh, document, also updated materials there. Um, this has some 160 pages, let's say. So compared to finance, uh, Python for Finance with 700 pages, it's like a more like a thinner volume, but it covers like the basics, all the basic notions and the most simple finance models. And it's a gentle introduction and it introduces not only and reviews, not only some finance notions that are pretty important, but also introduces like at the same time, simultaneously Python concepts based on very simple example so that is not like here the level of sophistication which like clouds what is all meant by that so um, when i started studying mathematical finance I, when you read research papers and still today back then it wasn't uh, too uh, too different there was so much math included and with all the math you somehow yeah couldn't tell what is kind of like the core of it and here i try to to put the core the core notions in the foreground and, and the, the mathematical and programming sophistication in the background. So all the, the examples are pretty, pretty simple. And you can get started here with the most simple model of uncertainty, two-state economy with like uh, just two points in time, which we then call the static two-state economy, static three-state economy, or where you can address uh, topics such as market incompleteness, which is uh, rather the rule than the exception, static multi-state um, economy, so generalizing the state space, and then also generalizing uh, the modeling of time where we talk about dynamic economies, right? So modeling uncertainty over time, which is basically the standard, right? Um, we say, well, uh, in reality, it's not that I decide at the beginning of the year about my portfolio for 2020 and um, just before or after Christmas, I have another look. No, it's like uh, information uh, resolves uh, over time, step by step, and this is what dynamic economies do. And so you get like from yeah, the most important uh, corners there, um, like a good overview of the basic notions. And at the same time, you learn Python. Uh, I think in a pretty, pretty gentle way. So here you see screenshots and I left them in here because this is um, like the uh, quote unquote old, the original platform to which everybody has already access, but with your credentials, you can also log in. And I've shared this in the um, orientation email also to base.pqp.io. Same credentials, same content should be the case. If not, <laughs> drop us a line. Um, and I will show you later on how this uh, looks because uh, the look and feel is completely different. It's not, and it's not only the look and feel, it's also the technical architecture. It's completely cloud-based, scalable, containerized, et cetera. So even there, we, we try to walk the talk, what we teach, we, we try to implement there ourselves. So you have basically the uh, content, the text, the material. You have the videos and all the videos and the content, they all come. So both categories come with Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, you can execute on both platforms, you can execute the Jupyter Notebooks directly. Not every code, sometimes, because maybe I'm not too specific in this regard, sometimes this might lead to confusion, uh, because not every code is really executed on the Quam platform. We try our best, but this has sometimes technical reasons. Sometimes you are requested, for example, to install something or to set up a new Python environment. And like on the platform, we cannot allow you to do everything that you can do on your local machine or when you fire up your own cloud instance. So um, when I say basically everything is executable on the platform, this has for sure its limits, right? So, um, but we teach you, we try to empower you to set up your own infrastructure that no matter what platform we think is best and, and how we like the platform to look like, you will have 
always the option to go with your own infrastructure. And then this is a question that I'm getting asked kind of regularly. Uh, what when I get started with your program on the on your platform? Is there a lock in and, and can I later on migrate to something else? And yes, this is what we uh, really expect you to do. Our platform is just a delivery mechanism. We don't want to have a lock in. But on the other hand, this is what we promise. You have indefinite access to your uh, resources. So when you say, well, maybe I know take a break after I finish my certificate and two months later or half a year later, you will still have access to your resources on the Chrome platform. So no lock-in, but nevertheless, indefinite access. I will show this um, in action um, in a minute or a couple of minutes where we have went through the, um, through the single classes. Tools and skills is exactly the class which empowers you to set up your own infrastructure. And on the left-hand side, in the first column, which has the, the header basics, this is exactly what this column, what this part is about, right? Python installation and environments. This assumes like a local environment. Then locally to use Docker and to set up Jupyter Notebook. And then to move already very early on to the cloud. And you see there for the first three blocks, there's uh, always like the differentiation in Mac Linux and Windows. Because the Mac Linux world is, is closely related, there are hardly any differences. Minor ones are there for sure when you work on the command line, but they are not huge because in the very beginnings, Mac was uh, developed on top of Linux and still uh, you can see where it's coming from. On Windows, some or even many things are different. So. And sometimes people ask me, oh, even what is kind of the best platform? Just today, I answered a question in the user forum. What is kind of the best setup for me? And I said, well, if, if I would need to set up a ranking, I would say Mac, because Mac has, for me, the nicest uh, graphical user interface. And the Mac world provides you with all the command line tools that you uh, just can imagine that so many people are used from Linux. If you then go to number two in my ranking, this will be Linux because we get all the command line tools, which we use in the Mac world as well. So basically they come from Linux, but well, for me, like the graphical user interface, like the operating system where you, when you want to do your emails or want to write a, a document in, in LibreOffice or Word or whatnot, this simply does not look too nice. And so um, therefore, this is the drawback that I see. But it's completely free and it's hardware independent, right? Mac is only available on Mac hardware. And then third, Windows. Maybe some people might now cry, well, Windows has improved. Yeah, Windows has improved. I must say with the PowerShell and Windows 10 Professional 64-bit, many, many things have improved when you see them in these um, classes. They are well documented and illustrated. So um, here in development, there's uh, code editing with WIM. That's like a powerful editor. Many people say, oh, well, this, the, the learning curve is too steep. I can't use that. I understand it. Uh, the reason why I advertise it and, and, and recommend it here is that WIM, for example, is an editor that you can use on every single platform you will face, right? You can use it locally on Mac, locally on Windows, locally on Ubuntu. You can use it in the cloud. It's open source and it's pretty powerful, right? <laughs> then when you add, for example, screen and queue to the mix, then you have like a lightweight tool chain, which provides from my point of view, the most important elements such as editing, logging, debugging uh, that you can use. Here, I would say mostly in the cloud uh, where you won't have like graphical code editing or whatnot. So, uh, but give it a try. Have a look at the, um, at the recordings and, and the resources there. If not, there are many alternatives, but this is uh, what you can use on all platforms. Therefore, I recommend it. Doc test, unit test, version control is a topic that we cover. Later on, if you say, well, I have written something beautiful that I want to share with my colleagues, with my friends, with the, uh, with the whole world, then Python packaging comes into play. So here we've got the distribution documentation and maybe some code hosting on GitHub. So many people say, well, if I don't have like the strongest background in the industry, uh, but I want to do your program, what else can I do? And what I always recommend is to build a portfolio on GitHub, right? So what used to be a resume, a CV, these days is a GitHub repository. There are so many recruiters. Uh, I can tell you stories that they reach out uh, people like me. They say, well, you know, seem to be a Python coder. I have a Python opening here and there. So maybe they should do a little bit more research. But what I wanted to say, this is what, if you are interested like in, in, in a quantitative role where coding, programming plays a role, this is kind of like 
the place to display what you've been working on and, and that you are working diligently and to show code quality. So I have often kind of issues, for example, when people hand in their final projects, this is something for later on, don't worry about the final project. And they, for example, don't adhere to the PEP 8 syntax standard. So I don't let anybody pass who doesn't hand in code that is uh, almost 100% PEP 8 conform. So this is the syntax. You will learn about it. You, should, you can Google it. You can look it up. Um, because this is like, you know, when, when you apply for a job and people have a look at your code, this should look like Python code, right? And not something like, oh, well, this is my individual style of writing down Python code. Um, this is what yeah, you should take into account when you host something. The content should be good, the approach should be uh, proper, and it should look as if you're... Uh, it's the same when you when you publish a research paper in math, physics, finance, whatever. Um, people expect you to write down proper English and have uh, uh, the commas in the right place and the blanks in the right places, etc. And the same holds true for Python. But this is maybe a story for a little bit later. And then there is a case study which combines all the other elements. So we have multiple interesting technologies that we cover there. So it's uh, the, the cloud, maybe um, um, we, uh, yeah, oh, there we use uh, DigitalOcean. You can use everything that comes underneath. So Docker can, for example, use in the cloud, but we can use it, of course, locally. We can run Python locally. We can run Python in Docker. We can run Python on a cloud instance or in a Docker on a cloud instance. So this is all what we can uh, do here. And usually, uh, let's say the, the goal is to deploy Jupyter notebook. Um, IPython is something that, that uh, comes uh, around in the backend anyways. And these days, um, I'm almost exclusively using Jupyter Lab locally. Also, the new uh, Aquam platform makes use of Jupyter Lab before we use Jupyter. So I thought like towards the end of the year, now it's time to change there. So all the classes that I teach, uh, they will uh, oh, have since quite a few months, uh, Jupyter Lab that I use. And before it was Jupyter, still Jupyter is uh, maintained and updated, etc. cetera, uh, a package. And Jupyter Lab also makes use of Jupyter, but Jupyter Lab comes along with a couple of uh, interesting features. We see a few of them later. Tools and skills you have for every class. You have the video recordings. You have like the resources, sometimes only Jupyter Notebook, sometimes additional scripts, files, or um, what I call representations or summaries uh, of shortcuts for tools, etc. So that's all there for you. Um, anytime you can access them, review them, download them, and use them. Python for financial data science, that's like the... Um, a class based on Python for finance, Python data structures, NumPy, Pandas, object-oriented programming, visualization, financial time series, input-output, performance Python, math tools, stochastics, statistics, and machine learning. That's quite a bit, right? So this would uh, probably, if we go into detail in every class, this would uh, be a program of its own. Um, but I think no matter whether you do computational finance, algo trading, only quote unquote financial data science or machine learning for finance in whatever uh, direction. These are topics that uh, yeah, help you in, in any, any uh, use case scenario, right? So th they are fundamental, they are basic and everybody who does Python for finance should know about these uh, topics in particular, right? The resources again are there. So uh, you have access not to the book itself and not to a PDF, but to the HTML rendering, which is um, exactly on par with regard to the first 13 chapters uh, to the currently published book, including all the updates for the reprints. Um, again, here you have it, the HTML plus the video recordings, plus the Jupyter Notebooks, and you can execute them, of course, on the Quant platform, or if you like, you can download them and uh, use them locally as well. And for all the books, there are also GitHub repositories. For all the published books, I must say, there are also GitHub repositories that um, have the book, uh, the, the, the book's content in terms of code on block. Python for Excel, I mentioned already when we went through the agenda, maybe not for everybody, the most important topic, but for many in the industry, it still is an important topic. And I know, and I, we, we focus here on Excel Wings, as a technology, 
which is from my point of view the best and most powerful one and uh, the, the main author uh, Felix Sumstein is somebody I, I know pretty well I just uh, last week I think it was last week Tuesday I'm not really sure it's <laughs> not too far away maybe a week or so um, I followed along a webinar that he gave and yeah, it's a well-maintained package it's pretty powerful it allows you to combine the analytical power of Python with the ease of like the graphical user interface of, um, of uh, yeah, Excel. And this is how I see Excel. So Excel today in many use cases is used as a database, which it is not. Um, it is used as like yeah, a programming environment, which it is to some extent and as a graphical user interface. So uh, back in the older days, this is what people differentiated, right? You have like the data part, the data layer represented by a database. You have the, the program logic in whatever language and you have the graphical user interface. So these three main layers. And uh, to, to some or a large extent, you can represent all the three layers in Excel, but maybe Excel has its strengths. And I would say this is on the graphical user interface side because it's so simple to come up with buttons, et cetera. But Excel has its absolute limits with regard to data storage because you cannot store larger amounts of data, sure not. You um, uh, uh, have with VBA a language that works, but not maybe in the most elegant way and easiest way in the world and also not in the most performant way. So why not using proper data storage and proper uh, programming and keep the strength of Excel, namely the ease of the um, graphical user interface. So uh, that's, that's like the basic idea, right? Combine the analytical power of Python with the data processing capabilities with the presentation layer, so to say provided out of the box by, by Excel. And of course, you, from there, you can combine it with other technologies. I mean, Excel um, can be connected to so many different things. That's a pretty, pretty powerful combination, for sure. There's somebody asking about the download and print of chapters. Um, basically, we do not recommend to do that. I know some people still do it, but <laughs> I would recommend reading on the iPad with the Adobe Acrobat Reader and do your marks on that. So this is how I do, and I really appreciate it. Uh, the reason why I'm a little bit reluctant to uh, encourage you to download and print is that we change things that often that um, almost surely what you have printed will be out of date, right? So just now I said on the weekend, um, I have I show you this later on, on the platform, we've updated, uh, or last week, we have updated two of the print of the, of the uh, major resources. So when you print this out, you can to some extent, but we, uh, it's not even possible for everything that we provide. For, for, and I think for good reason. So, uh, to put it that way. So, Python for databases, also kind of interesting. If you use uh, SQL or NoSQL database or some other specific formats like PyTables or SQLchemy as an abstraction layer, or BCalls as a specialized package for columnar data. So, again, people might say, well, I don't have anything to do with database, but think of it. Sometime in the future, you might work for a certain company or face with such a topic, or you yourself run into an issue, maybe just like a smaller one where you say SQLite, for example, is like a good choice for me. Um, and now I need to know how it works. This is what this class is all about, basically. You have, as before, the videos, the resources, and here you also get like a full fledged script which sets up everything technology wise that you need in the cloud because, for example, installing um, MySQL on Windows, uh, I don't want to lie, but as far as I can tell, it does not work at all. So you need to have another environment. And here, at this point, when you are supposed to get started with this optional class, you know how to set up a cloud instance, etc. And uh, therefore, we provide you with a script and you run the script and the script installs quote put everything that is required for this class, right? All the Python stuff, all the, the database stuff, et cetera. And once you're finished with the class and you say, well, I want to continue using it, 
that's fine if you say, well, the class is finished. Currently, I don't have any use case for that. That's fine as well. Then you simply um, you simply destroy the droplet. If you use it for two days, for example, let's say, or three days or whatever, then you can uh, uh, destroy it and you are not built uh, any further. Because in the cloud, you just get uh, built by the hour and uh, not for like, let's say, a full month when you start using it mid-month, let's say. So it's all by the hour and it's pretty, pretty cost efficient. So you just need a smaller cloud instance there. Natural language processing, this is a smaller cloud, but we cover quite a bit of ground in this natural language processing class. It was an outgrowth of a client project um, where we have come up with uh, a bunch of helper functions um, that we wrote up with. And I thought, well, this is really helpful, not for us in this context, because I couldn't find anything comparable. And this is what we present here in this rather brief class, but uh, be sure we needed to make our experience and we came up with what we see there, um, which is yeah already, I think, kind of helpful what we present there, no matter what yeah, kind of unstructured data, which means in general text, you face. So you can parse, for example, HTML, documents or you can work with PDF documents which are converted to text files and then you parse the text files. You can generate word clouds after you've done the class and all these nice, interesting things. Um, so natural language processing, um, a pretty, pretty um, important part today. Maybe I must confess a little bit underrepresented in what we do, but again, although this is a smaller class, you get kind of like uh, already a strong tool set. And, all the optional classes, if you say, for example, you see in the overview of the study plan that this comes last in the optional column, but if you say, well, this is what I'm excited about, this is what I can make use of, and feel free to basically um, uh, to basically get started early with that, right? If you say, well, I don't want to do Excel, skip Excel, for example, move on and uh, simply do the NLP part a bit earlier. That's, uh, that's, of course, the freedom that you have, in particular with the optional classes, because they don't really have any dependencies. Of course, you would need to understand a little bit of Python coding, uh, but after you, after you start, let's say after the first uh, two or three weeks, you should be, for example, uh, able to get uh, pretty well through this class here as well. Artificial intelligence and finance, this has become a core class, so to say. It's based on um, yeah the early raw and unedited version of my manuscript, which is edited to some extent already in the first five chapters. Currently, the early release comprises three chapters exactly, and maybe at the end of the week, beginning of next week, two more chapters will come, and now we go through it. Uh, there are just two chapters, the more general conclusion chapters are not yet uh, finished, but the rest is there as a draft and currently under tech review and you have access here to the latest version. Um, this is how it looks when it is rendered as a, a, a O'Reilly PDF. I'm pretty sure you have uh, seen already O'Reilly books is, um, as a printed book looks nicer, but I think you have like with the HTML version that we provide, you can search better, you can navigate easily, right? So this should, um, this should work uh, out of the box. And seamlessly, I think. So um, here is the major chart I've been using, I think, for the last 25 talks that I've given. I've used this chart because I think the whole world of finance, uh, which is a world uh, on the theory side, in which I've been growing up since my, my early studies at university and, and, of course, since my PhD, uh, has changed tremendously. Financial markets are basically information processing uh, machines, if you like, and uh, no matter what data you feed the machine, they come up with more or less immediate uh, answers and responses in terms of like price changes, updates, whatever. And this in a nonlinear, complex and changing fashion. But finance theory, I think, hasn't um, been able to keep up with that. So traditionally, finance theory was driven by brilliant brains and normative economics. They say, well, let's assume the world works like X, Y, that. And let's assume that agents in the financial markets um, <laughs> like expected return and hate uh, volatility, for example. So mean variance portfolio theory. And given all these assumptions, I'm able, I'm maybe Harry Markowitz, I'm able to show that uh, mean variance portfolio theory leads to the following result, or 
the capital asset pricing model predicts that uh, the beta explains the, the expected return of a single stock relative to the, the market index. But if you put this theory to a, a proper, a thorough empirical test, then more often than not, you find that yeah, there's hardly any explanatory power. So you feed in X, the data of the market, and uh, F might be any kind of model here. Um, and there's no predictive power, right? And this is what I call brain-driven and beauty myth. Um, but today with AI and finance, we get back to the data itself, to positive economics, like in physics, or as I say, in the hard science. Let's have a look at the data. Let's discover relationships. And only then let's try to explain what's going on and not the other way around, right? Let's assume the world works like X, Y, that. But I mean, we can understand in the 50s, 60s and 70s, there was hardly any meaningful data. And people simply tried in their offices to make sense of what is going on in the world. But now, even we sitting at our desktops or laptops back home have access to basically unlimited data. And we should use this and have a look at the data, at the relationships that we uh, discover. And we can apply machine learning algorithms, general, parameterizable, trainable algorithms. And the focus in the AI and finance class is on, is on neural networks. And they are known to uh, be strong and capable in discovering relationships, patterns, and in um, yeah, being able to predict in certain contexts uh, pretty well what's going to happen next, right? And maybe we can replace theory a little bit by something that is a little bit like a black box, but nevertheless might be better in terms of the market performance than the original theory. So. That's the basic idea here and more on that, of course, in this class, which runs over the whole first 12 weeks. So there are 12 sessions and that's one. That's why I meant this has become one of the core classes. Then we have six sessions which are dedicated and six sessions on top of the 12. So we have a total of 18 sessions in AI and reinforcement learning. <clears throat> and here, yeah, we cover the, the so successful Q learning algorithm, deep Q learning, to be exact. And uh, yeah, this is what inspires me most. Like uh, I can relate so well to the card games from the 80s, Atari. And I was so fascinated by the AlphaGo story when in 2016, DeepMind was able uh, with the AlphaGo uh, Lee iteration of its algorithm to beat the world champion. But this is really what, what got me intrigued and excited in the field. And um, this is the class where we also cover a few games. We cover three games, attack them by reinforcement learning. And afterwards, after we understand what's going on and how this is uh, like working, we apply what we have learned in this context to trading, to algorithmic trading as well. So we um, have like these examples and I have here like there are videos behind that. That's the, that's the one thing that's from the program. This is what we do there. And you see, this is the mountain car problem. And the game is to push the car to the left and to the right and to make sure that it gains enough momentum so that it reaches here at the finish line, right? So this is a game that we cover here uh, in this uh, particular part. Um, that's still simple enough. What is kind of a bit more involved is the Lunar Lander. And you might know this. This has been a popular uh, card game in the 80s, I think. So the Lunar Lander and my algorithm, which is pretty simple. So we start with the algorithm for the simple card pool game. And here, uh, basically the same agent is supposed to learn to land the spaceship between the two flags. So, and you see there are now not only two actions that the spaceship can take, you can accelerate it to the left, to the right, you have then the major engine at the bottom and the whole thing is considered to be a success when without crashing the spaceship, um, without crashing the spaceship, you land it. And you see uh, that there are algorithms which are more involved, uh, but I didn't want to go too large there, that are able to land this much, much 
faster. But still, this has been a soft landing here, this one one. And it comes to rest here in between. So this is then considered a success. And when you see finished 410, this means that 410 actions have been taken by the um, part. <clears throat> oh, there's somebody asking about the 12 and 6 numbers. Yeah, the, uh, the um, you see it, we have basically in AI, if you like, we have two classes. This is the AI and finance class. This has 12 sessions itself. And reinforcement learning and finance has six additional sessions. So you could think, and this is true, that reinforcement learning is part of AI, but we have a separate class. And this is what I meant. We have a total for the two classes of 18 sessions. This is what I meant here in this regard. Because we cover, again, like fun stuff there as well uh, here in the form of the games. But of course, um, in the focus, there are the... Um, uh, the applications then to finance and to trading. So we have like a Monte Carlo simulation based finance environment where we train our DQL agent and also then, uh, of course, proper real world data where we train it as well. And all is to be seen in this context against the background of algorithmic trading. So the major example is to train an agent, whatever agent this is. An agent can be a simple neural network, can be um, a recurrent neural network or an SCM. As a special case, it can be a reinforcement learning agent based on a deep Q learning algorithm, but to train them to be able to predict the future direction of the financial market for algorithmic trading. And this is now the core class. In algorithmic trading, of course, we have the foundations for everything that we do. Foundations are important. Before we get started with the class itself, we have finance with Python. We discussed that financial data science. And then here we get started with the uh, um, real topics, so to say, vectorized backtesting, prediction-based trading, event-based backtesting. Here we have uh, then real-time data and streaming, the on the trading platform in the last round. And of course, you've access to that as well. I have done the Rwanda uh, masterclass. So for Rwanda, we have the regular class plus four classes on top of that. So Rwanda is what we cover in, in most detail because from my point of view, it's the one best suited for algo trading. We cover also FXCM, interactive brokers, Gemini for cryptocurrency trading, and automation and review is what we have last, where we then put everything from before into the mix. Um, and deploy our stuff in the cloud. Experience, uh, the final column here is about practice module one. So you should come up with your own strategy. You should backtest it thoroughly. Practice module two is to take your strategy and to deploy it. And then in the final project, this can be related, but usually it is not to the practice modules. In the final project, you should come up with your research paper. So by research, this is quote unquote here. Um, uh, more on the details of the final projects later. Some people I know from experience start bothering at the very beginning about the final project. Give yourself time. Don't worry too much about the final project. Uh, when time comes, I will inform you and you will be well prepared for the final project, right? So that's the, the overview of the Python for algo trading class. And this is again based, uh, this will be based on, on uh, completely updated uh, materials. I'm currently through the materials. There are 12 chapters in total. Uh, for the book, we only published 10 chapters plus the appendix. So it used to be, and it is 12 plus one. The book will only have 10 plus one. And I'm through currently uh, the first six chapters. So when we reach seven, eight, nine, ten, they will all be there <clears throat> in time, right? This is my thinking in terms of algo trading and the class. We start with the infrastructure. Financial data is an important topic. Then we cover a bunch of different strategies. We backtest the strategies, both in vectorized fashion as well as in the event-based fashion. We cover kind of intensively connecting codes or so working with real-time data, real-time visualization, streaming data, all these things, right? And then the trading code itself, because it's a little bit different when you define your strategy offline 
and you say, well, that's my idea, and I back tested it, et cetera. But then there comes a point where you want to go online. So there's like computer science terms. Offline means you have the data set up front. Online means that the data set on which your work changes over time, changes in real time, right? And this is exactly what you face in trading. You need to be able to deal with real-time data updated, I don't know, a couple of times per second. And nevertheless, you, you must be able to, to come up with your signals and to implement your strategy, right? So this is what we then cover in trading code. But for this, you need the platform, right? We, until this point, connecting code, basically, we can get by without a proper trading platform. But from trading code onwards, we need the, um, the platform, whatever broker we use for that. And last but not least, automation. When it runs somehow, you should make sure at a certain point that it runs safely and robustly. So that's uh, the point here in this regard. These seven layers are, this is my thinking structure since years. And so far, I haven't seen any reason to change that. And we walk through this diligently and we will have a couple of loops here, right? So this is not like, a, although the, the error might indicate otherwise, but this is not like a straight leveling up over time. So we will have a couple of loops here in between. The uh, masterclass or under, uh, since the last round, we have uh, opened, so to say, the uh, AI machine to uh, select the delegates. This is based on a challenge, and you should argue pretty well if you want to make use of the AI machine. Um, so, therefore, I have uh, in the last round have set up the under masterclass to go quite a bit deeper into this topic because the AI machine is um, implemented on based on Wanda. It's not, let's say, the only broker that we could use, but from our experience, it's the best one that we can currently uh, use for what we are interested uh, in AI-powered uh, real-time algorithmic trading strategies. Intraday, not high frequency, but intraday, I would say mid-frequency. Now let's get to the case study in algo trading. Uh, as I said before, I haven't um, uh, covered Python for computational finance. I put now the uh, case studies um, in between. I've prepared for a couple of these case studies and demos. First, I get started with the uh, form platform. Um, then I show you a little bit of Python with Docker, efficient markets, model calibration, DX analytics. These two here are from the computational finance part. Market prediction, Wanda, and reinforcement learning, then again, are um, for algo trading. So that's uh, the stuff that I wanted to show. And just a word of caution, what I'm now going to do is by no means meant to be a training. It is not educational, didactical. It is just for illustration. It's just to whet your appetite. Everything that you will see now is covered in detail in the single classes. This is just like a quick overview, a quick, yeah, again, a glimpse at what to expect in the, in the different uh, classes. So that's, uh, that's the take. So therefore, uh, don't bother when you say, well, um, um, well, let's, uh, yeah, let's have a look and don't worry too much <laughs> what the details are. Sometimes I will jump over a couple of, of rows and blocks and whatnot. Uh, again, it's more showing demonstration, illustration than is any kind of training. So there's another question with regard to uh, the best effects broker. Um, I'm not saying that's the best FX broker. I, what I say and try to emphasize from our experience, given the technology that they offer, it's the best for algorithmic trading that I'm aware of that we have been working with. So um, it's for sure, for sure, a biased view on the world that I say I wonder, but I use it since years. It's really reliable. It works like for, for what we do. Our whole world is like best implemented and, and, um, yeah, deployed in the end um, in this context, so uh, with regard to this uh, platform. <clears throat> uh, there's somebody asking about the AI machine, <laughs> and uh, it's a clear no, it's not available to everybody. So uh, first you need to get through the program, uh, and we restricted it to the platinum. 
package uh, delegates in the last round, but this is uh, basically the Air Machine is completely separate to the program. So this is uh, even a separate company right, that we run, but we provide access based on a challenge toward the very end. This is then related to the uh, practice modules. And uh, it's somehow uh, that you need to qualify. And it then comes without cost, basically. So uh, we would then offer um, to host it for you for a certain period of time that you can play around with it. And you can see whether it is something you would like to use uh, later on. So to make it clear, the yeah, iMachine is currently not available to anybody. It's not even available for licensing or for whatever um, um, topic. Yeah, there is. Uh, what are the criteria? This is something that we communicate later on. So uh, bear with me. This is uh, we have our sequence there, and uh, it is related then to the practice module one and the practice module two of the at the end to, uh, of this uh, part. And this is then outlined in detail um, when we are through the elements. Um, and I think the platform is not like a platform AI machine. Uh, it's not like a platform where you simply log in and you have plug and play. So um, the reason why I'm doing it that way is that I think that you have 10 times, 100 times more benefit of the platform if you have gone through the program and you know the thinking and what this is all about. Otherwise, it uh, might be a little bit too, too steep of a, of a curve to get started at all. Huh, will you, that, that's a good question. Will you be able to do everything that the AI machine can do raw? So I interpret this that if you, if you are able to implement it. And I can say basically, yes. So the, the approach of the AI machine is the standardized deployment of whatever strategy. So we can, we can run reinforcement learning agents there. We can run deep neural networks. We can run recurrent neural networks. We can run simple moving average based ones. We can use like any technique that we have. Uh, but the deployment part is always the same and it has real-time streaming, uh, et cetera. So the, the big deal is not to come up with the strategy, but the deployment has uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code and not only Python, but JavaScript. And, and, and we use Elasticsearch for logging and all that stuff. So uh, basically, yes, but we wouldn't have implemented the platform if it would be so simple. Um, you can think of it like an algorithm also on our platform might have 200 lines of code, to keep it simple. But uh, the deployment code has uh, uh, 20,000, 25,000 lines of code plus. So on our platform, right? But you will, it's a good question. You will, we go through all the single steps that are uh, standardized on the, on the AI machine, but we go through it and you learn it. You, you learn them all, that's for sure. We don't keep anything back <laughs> if this might be like the background of the... Uh, of the question. So Quant Platform first. So we have the two Quant Platforms. I start with the original one because everybody has access to the original one. And I don't want to spend too much time on the Quant Platform. You, we have videos, you can access them. Um, and um, you see here already, maybe I increase this a bit more for the presentation. You see here already like two buttons update. And this, for example, is material that I've updated over the course of last week. And I didn't click the buttons update because once I click them, they vanish. But I just wanted to show you that Finance with Python has been updated, AI and Finance, the codes and the text as well, I think, have been updated. So you can always, when you see these, they will be updated for you, right? And we have, for example, here, this is the, um, I can show you, the text is updated. This is May 2020, this from the weekend, but the codes um, have been updated there, I think as well. And the PDF, exactly, the PDF has been updated there as well, right? So that's uh, the one thing. And when I click, for example, on update, it says now, well, there are like, you have files. We want to make sure that these files are still um, available if you have made some changes. And when you click on update, it says successfully updated, and you see this update button vanishes there, right? So this was one update, and uh, this button only appears again when um, later on there is another update. So this is the HTML text. You can navigate this nicely here via links, etc. That's the benefit. You can also search that. And you have the file manager 
via which you can also go to the FinPy folder because there was a question. In the FinPy folder, you find, for example, the Jupyter Notebooks, Finance with Python, approach of the course. This is from the uh, text itself, right? <laughs> the first chapter is pretty short. You see, there's not that much in there, but you can execute it here on the platform, right? Um, and in the FinPy folder, you also find the FinPy course PDF. You have received the, uh, the password for that, right? So, and once I've put in the password, you see it's 159 pages. This is something you can, for example, download and use on, um, I don't know, iPad or whatnot, whatever you, wherever you read that. So I'm, I'm an iPad guy. You see, this is also May. So this has been updated just um, on the weekend, for the weekend, on the weekend, I think Friday. Maybe I've updated that, right? And it's the same text. The content is not, <laughs> it's not different. It's just like the PDF version of the same thing. So you have the HTML tags, you have the Jupyter Notebooks, you have the PDF version, that's all there. And I've already used the file manager to navigate there because you need the file manager to access that. And you see here old versions. And if they have been older versions, they are stored in here. And you see there have been a couple of updates, version until 2017, 18, 19, you see here, 19, there have been two updates. And here's like the version which has been updated um, at the 18th of um, May. So all your old version, if you have changed them or whatnot, they are still um, they are still available. That's FinPy. But there is more to FinPy. Namely, if we stick to this class, Finance with Python down here, you see now in this part, there are the video recordings. And when you see like um, in the study plan, finance with Python 1, that's this video, that's that module here. There's also the video and you can click on the link. This opens the module. There might be further links to the resources. There is the video. I can click on the video. This runs here when I get started with it. So and the video starts immediately, right? That's the video that is referenced, for example. And here, we also have some other Jupyter Notebooks. You can double click on these Jupyter Notebooks as well. And if you wanna get more real estate here, you can also fold up, for example, the upper pane. And there are the other uh, Jupyter Notebooks available. So this is what I meant when I said the text has its own Jupyter Notebooks, the videos have in general their own Jupyter Notebooks. So make sure that you access all the, uh, the resources in the proper places. This was one Jupyter Notebook from Finance with Python 01, the module, right? And this I've opened here via the link. There is the link for module number two. So these are the resources and this structure is basically available for the other class as well. Let's have a look at Python for Finance. So Python for Finance, that's uh, the HTML version of the first 13 chapters of my book with the same title, right? So you have that here. For that, there is no PDF because this has been published as book, but of course you have we have a look here, financial data science, that's the corresponding class. And there are the videos. So you always have the overview of all the recordings up there. This is the, the first module data types and structures. A link again, there is the video. There are, as before, here a couple of Jupyter notebooks, right? So this is how it works here on this platform. So feel free to explore it, but I said it already, you have also access to the new one. So I don't know what this is not here, HTTPS. There are maybe a couple of things that are not secure. So this is the login and I sent you the link today in the email base.pqp.io. That's login to the new one and your credentials work as well on the new platform. This now looks completely different. You might say, oh, well, there's there's much less than <laughs> on the other platform. Yeah, but this, um, I can assure you, there's not less functionality, nor is there fewer content. 
for sure not. So let me just check whether I'm in the right, yeah, I'm in the right uh, account because I have multiple accounts. To here on the right, uh, the upper left hand side, you see here the three lines. When you click on them, you see here user forum, courses, trainings, Jupyter Lab. So user forum is on the other platform as well. So I rather focus here on the new platform because I want to encourage you to use the new uh, Quant platform and give us feedback. How you like it, what, what you see there. And uh, we have already one group of master students, a whole class from university that is on the new platform. And you are now uh, the first cohort of our program uh, that uh, follows here. And in the user forum, that's important we haven't covered that you see here the overview we have these boards quant platform is general certificate program finance with python python financial data science algo trading computational finance and dx analytics right so let's go to i don't know finance with python the first class and if you have a question with regard to um, finance with python which starts immediately this week you simply can post it here in the user forum there are some there are for example it's, um, I think, one of our current delegates who has posted two things. And these two things that have been pointed out, this has already been included in the AI and Finance book. And this was also very valuable uh, post there, which pointed out uh, an issue, like an error, a mathematical um, issue in finance with Python. And I've included this as well. And you have access to the updated version, right? And you can... Also use, as you can see here, uh, to, um, to put in math equations. As you can see, I have uh, replied to that. You have maybe here, there's usually not that much of a code. Maybe there's a little bit, ah, there's quite a bit of code, right? You can do some syntax highlighting for Python code, and this makes life pretty easy. So please don't use email for that. Post it here in the forum. I and our team, we get emails anyways, immediately, right? Whenever you post something, I don't know, 30 seconds later, we retrieve an email um, where we get informed about the post, see the contents and can uh, reply via email. Usually I log in and answer it then here and here as I did as well. So you have all the options. Um, when I say, for example, here reply, this is the uh, post and you see here, you can do quite a few things. You can um, you can embed uh, source code, you can highlight, bold, italic, uh, whatever different styles, formatting. You can preview, um, you can put in math equations. So it gives you quite a bit of flexibility to post your questions, to post answers. I can encourage you also to post answers. Uh, you learn a lot by, by thinking of uh, questions from others and trying to come up with solutions. And that's basically what you have here as a functional. Right, and there are all these boards, and uh, I think the most active is usually Python for algo trading. We have more than a thousand replies today. There was a question with regard to lock returns. There's a question with regard to reinforcement learning, data normalization, memory capacity for agent. I see this is all related here to that stuff. And you see, of course, there are multiple pages, interactive broker, new sentiment, and reinforcement learning. So all interesting uh, topics there that you can browse and have a look at, uh, at it particularly. So that's the user forum. Make use of it. It's there for you. It's your user forum. Make use of it. Try to, I mean, I mean, sometimes it might not be completely clear, but if you study finance with Python, I would put the question here, finance with Python, right? So tools and skills, uh, you can put where you see fit, for example, certificate program. Uh, although certificate program, this is open to all others as well. So here we don't differentiate in this regard. So then we have the courses. These are now the texts. Maybe I open AI and finance. This opens the AI and finance text. See here, this has quite a bit of content. A rough currently, the PDF stands at 440 pages. Roughly, so algo trading, vector as back testing, risk management, execution and deployment. Outlook, these are the two chapters that are not yet implemented. Appendices, technical appendices, interactive uh, neural networks, neural network classes. Um, 
I said, Russell, now that I just have a look, there should be a third one. Where is the third one? Maybe I, we need to update that as well. <laughs> so I thought it was, would be the latest version because I, I have added a third, a third um, uh, appendix there as well, a third technical one. But this is not an important one for what we cover. So it's, it's not even referenced in what we cover, but uh, maybe we should uh, give this another shot and, and update it accordingly now that we have gone this one. So this is one thing, but you see the others as well, right? See a Python for algorithmic trading. Um, this is not yet updated here, but this will be updated when we get started in week three with the content. So I told you here from all these chapters, I'm now through chapter four, which is updated and I'm, I'm moving on pretty fast here. Um, given that it should be published soon. So this, uh, whenever we reach something, um, I make sure that you will have access to the latest updated version. But this is nothing that you are supposed to read from the beginning. Um, this starts um, earliest in week three in this regard, right? So this is what we have. Then we have the, the trainings themselves. They also look different. You see here tutorials, AI and finance. Uh, Pyalgo program, tools and skills, natural language processing, all that stuff that we have seen before. Maybe I pick, I don't know, the AI and finance class. And let me, I need to reload. Do a hard reload. There was some old CSS because this is under active development. This is not something that is uh, now finished. It's under active development. And you saw like the maybe a little bit ugly looking this is what what is this there's something this is this is more under development that i would love to see there so i need to check this later on let me see whether this is with that class ah, i hear it looks but it's also there's like it's a little bit strange that it doesn't show me the um the uh things right there so cha 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 Cha, 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 something I need to. These should be much smaller here, the Jupyter notebooks. You see, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is something that is currently just developed, but um, this should be pretty small, right? So, uh, but I don't know. <laughs> Basically, um, I'm pretty sure this will be, uh, when you lock in next time, this will be, this is an easy thing. There's maybe some CSS which is still in my, um, in my cache. Let me. No, this is something I don't really like this too much. Uh, full history, and let me empty the cache here. Um, probably can say you no know, cached images and file. With CSS, it's uh, with CSS, it's uh, yeah, there's somebody pointing out it's working well on, on Chrome, but this is not a Chrome issue. I have Chrome as well. This is like a caching issue because I know that this is the old CSS there. So I have now probably, I hope I have uh, gotten rid of the, um, of the old CSS file. Um, this is when stuff is under active development. No, sorry, I need, I need to. I need to check what's I need to check what's going on here. I'm a little bit I'm a little bit surprised that this is <laughs> you see these huge things. There should be small little icons. But anyways, again, this afternoon this will all be resolved. But you have here also, of course, um, the um, the um, the single videos that you can watch. You have the code that you can execute, and uh, you have seen that. Basically, the whole structure is not as before that you have the Jupyter Notebook at the core. You see, there is no like Jupyter Notebook as it was on PQP1. What we have here however, is that we have Jupyter Lab, right? Um, open in another tab, uh, proceed. So I open Jupyter Lab. This takes a bit, and we now have Jupyter Lab opened here in the cloud. And uh, the Jupyter Labs are now containerized. So when I run my Jupyter Lab, I don't share, let's say, the infrastructure, maybe the physical infrastructure, but not the logical one, the virtual one with anybody else. Same holds true for you. And here, for example, I have like my files, pandas, simple thing. Um, it's an example file. 
that I've used to illustrate something, that's my file. So you can save here, you can create a new folder. Um, like here you see, I encourage you to work with JupyterLab more intensively. I can say here new folder, for example, I create a new folder. If I want to delete this folder, I delete the folder. So all the file management capabilities of JupyterLab, they are pretty well worth. So much, much better than what we had before with um, Jupyter only. So of course you can increase this for better readability. I said, this is one of my files. And why do I emphasize my files? Yeah, because we have here the course materials, FinPy and Pi4Fi, Pi, FinPy and pi 4 Pi and um, also the trainings, so AI in finance and all the other ones. I have quite a few here. And reinforcement learning. And here you see, for example, for the reinforcement learning one class, when I click on the first one, it opens now the um, first Jupyter notebook of the class reinforcement learning. Um, this is something that comes a little bit later in the sequence, but. Um, for finance with Python, as I've been um, showing that before, that's basically the same, right? The introduction and overview, there's just a file, so not that much more in there. We have, um, uh, no, I went back a little bit too far. Um, Python and Linux, Python toolchain, etc. right? So you see like all these, where do we have a little bit of a larger one, like financial data science, here you see NumPy, Pandas, Performance Python, Python Basics, Quant Platform, so all the different things, Stochastics, one of my favorite topics, this is also a larger Jupyter Notebook, this comes also later. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, there's somebody asking whether um, installs are possible. This was one of the ideas that we had because originally we had a, a really shared infrastructure with PKP um, one, with the original one, where we couldn't allow people to do their installs. But now with the uh, containerized Jupyter Lab version, we are much more flexible in giving you uh, your freedom to install your own packages, etc. We need to make sure to some extent that this remains stable, but since it is a Docker containerized uh, affair, it's not that much of a risk, right? So all the files that you see there, this file in particular, right? This is like a fixed file. You cannot change that. You cannot save it now. So if you have this file and uh, um, you want to do something with it, you would need to do something like save notebook S and you would save it in a different, in a different location, right? So you cannot destroy, quote unquote, the files that you have access to. They are like secured, rights-wise, uh, and you have lots of flexibility within your Docker container. But I mean, you know, it's just like um, that we need to make sure um, that nothing serious is happening there. But it's a good question because this was, uh, uh, among others, this was like one, um, this was one um, uh, issue that we wanted to address with the redesign here in this context. But feel free. So reach out and we want to learn what your requirements are. We are still, again, an active development and uh, you're the first uh, larger group to make use of it beyond the student group that I mentioned before, right? So make sure that you uh, save copies here or make duplicates, for example, uh, before you save your work there. So I'm now here say, yeah, I haven't uh, changed anything. This is um, another one, reinforcement learning. So you have a full-fledged environment. You can also, I mean, if you say, well, um, I wanna do some work here, you can do, uh, of course, like an upload from your local machine Right, this is not my FinPy text, uh, the, the FinPy text, my file folder. Um, you can upload, but you can also at the same time, uh, you can download, right? Here you can say download the file. So it is in the cloud, but you are free and flexible to upload files, data files, let's say that you wanna use. And you can, if you have done some work, you can download it to your local folder as well. Again, we are not here in the business of having a lock in um, and, and to have you locked into our platform. No, 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 you, you, we provide you this as an infrastructure, so you don't need to install anything, at least not in the beginning. And we teach you how to set up your own 
infrastructure, right? So that's like the new, the new approach that we we have built. But again, maybe you're a little bit like flexible with what you see there um, because, um, yeah, we we are like in still early ages. So many financial companies say you you are in a um, in an EAP program, right? <laughs> even even before beta, you are like in an alpha program early adopter program. Um, so this is how I see it. And whenever you say, well, maybe uh, I can relate more to this uh, approach, then feel free to use the platform. The content is the same. The functionality is a little bit differently structured. You see the whole approach is, is uh, quite different in the presentation, on the presentation layer, but the contents is basically the same. I would prefer here the Jupyter Lab because I fell in love recently with Jupyter Lab, to be honest. So therefore, I encourage you to use the new version there as well. And you have for example, also cool um, terminal access, right? You can within your within your um, terminal, you can do uh, execute systems system commands and do many many other things as well, right? So um, that's uh, what we have there. Also, the text editing for sure. You can write here like your, I don't know import numpy as np np, and now it's just a text file. But if you change the name to um, example.py, then you see immediately that the, uh, that, uh, the text changes to code, and code meaning here that we have, um, that we have syntax highlighted, right? So, Maybe something like this. This is now even executable. And when I start, let's say, a new terminal here, I have my file. Oh, this is like in, um, this is like not the proper startup file in notebooks. Now I have my file here. When I increase it a bit, you see it better. Um, hmm. Well, is that it's frozen? What happens? <laughs> my my whole interface is frozen. Now we are there. Um, I thought I would have a, a fast machine here, but <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, also frozen. So uh, no, there is a, there's somebody asking about the virtual GPU. No, 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 we don't have GPU. This is still today pretty pretty expensive, and for all what we do, we don't need a GPU um, at all. Um, and somebody's asking about. Um, um, there's somebody asking, ah, about the final project. Yeah, now that we are here in the in the coding side, so Python example, now I can execute it, right? And it simply prints out my random numbers there. So there was just like a, a short sleeping period, which is probably due to my Mac and not to the cloud itself, right? But feel free to explore it. This is like all for you you have all the options. In terms of copyright of the final project, yeah, this is something that you hand us in and um, we would never publish something um, that uh, which we are not agree on mutually, but uh, you should only hand in stuff that you can easily share. For example, no proprietary data is used, no secret, which means like data which is um, under some form of uh, NDA or whatnot. So uh, I wouldn't care too much about the copyright because we usually don't publish it, but it's also um, something that you should rather treat as open source. So you should write it as if you would put it on GitHub and share it with the, with the world, which does not mean that you have not the copyright, right? Um, but the rights of distribution, et cetera, you should keep them, uh, you should think of them as as open as possible, like an MIT license, right? So just like um, we have gone through already uh, quite a bit far, um, but uh, I, was so, I was so keen to, um, to get uh, through the, um, to the new platform there, although you saw we need to, do a little bit of stuff there. But just like a quick thing in terms of Docker, when people say, well, I, I'm not running Docker here, right? I need to start up Docker. No, I don't need 
the latest version. <coughs> Intro minus P. Ah, this should be good to go. I, I don't want to do that many things. I'm just um, starting a Docker container. Again, this is all explained in detail in the class tools and skills. I just wanted to show you how easy it is to, to install all that stuff. Uh, by all that stuff, I mean a Python environment in an empty Thing. So I'm now starting a Docker container um, on my Mac, which runs now Ubuntu in the container. And in this container, that's the reason why I use this for illustration. I have no Python. So this Docker container comes with no Python. When I type Python here, it says, well, come on, not found. So let's get started. We do a little bit of update here to have the latest uh, package index. And what we recommend using, and we show this in detail, is the mini conda installer. And this is available for all the platforms, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. I choose Linux here, copy the link address. And in my container now, I change to the root folder and what i now need is wget and oh not even wget this is really a standard tool so i need to install wget but it is a, a pretty small tool so i can now install this linux tool this is available on mac as well and i now copy uh, or paste my copied address and i'm downloading the miniconda installer Miniconda means it's Python plus a little bit. Anaconda is the large installation with like 150 packages. Now I execute the Miniconda installer. Yeah, I do it again. Don't worry if this is a little bit fast. I say yes. I say okay. And it now installs Python. And I say yes, right? When I now type Python, I still don't have it. I need to restart my bash. And now you see it says base up front. This shows that I have Python. And indeed, now I have Python 3.7.6 from January 2020. So let us exit. But usually I don't use idle here, the standard prompt. What I use is IPython. And often I use NumPy. No MKL is a meta package. So I say, please, Conda, install IPython NumPy. Yes, do so. It now downloads the packages. There are quite a few given the dependencies and I should be good to go. So IPython, now I'm in the world that I would use, for example, on the shell. IPython is much better, more efficient, nicer, more functionality than the standard Python prompt. And I can now say import numpy snp, what I did before np random random at maybe 10 random numbers so and i'm done so this was a matter of a few minutes only and from scratch i have installed python ipython and our power numerical package numpy and i'm good to go of course there are many many more steps that i can now go installing panda scikit-learn tensorflow keras then i would uh, probably set up jupyter lab I, I would maybe want to make it secure by using SSL encryption in the cloud, by using a password uh, protection, et cetera, pp. But this is the start. And you see, to start starting a Docker container, installing all that stuff in a Docker container is a matter of minutes. I did it now pretty fast, but be assured all the details in the tools and skills class, right? So just a quick demo. Efficient markets. So in algo trading, this we are still like in the algo trading part. Now I go to my local machine. This is where I have prepared my uh, stuff there. And I have here now a, this is a Jupyter notebook, which I run in a Jupyter lab, obviously. Here, which um, is from the AI in finance class, right? I do a couple of imports, and this is about the efficient market hypothesis, which in simplified terms says that the best predictor of tomorrow's price 
in the least square sense, is today's price. And this is what this little Jupyter notebook does. You see here, I'm reading data from a remote source. This is like an updated data source from the new PyAlgo book or materials. 10 years worth of end of day data, Apple, Microsoft, Intel, Amazon, Goldman Sachs, SPY, ETF, the S&P 500, the VIX volatility index, Euro, yesterday exchange rate, gold quotation and GDX, GLD, gold ETFs. I calculate the lock returns. You see, I'm, I'm going quickly. I just comment uh, briefly on that. I normalize the data and plot it here. So Cufflinks is one of my favorite plotting libraries. Map or lib is a standard one, but with cufflinks and plotly, we get like in a Jupyter notebook, we get interactive visualization. And for example, here when we say, well, how does it look here? We can easily zoom in and can, you know, go here even closer and then zoom out again. So this is just like a normalized time series uh, visualization of all the time series in my data. But then what we also discussed to some extent is non-normality of returns. Here the lock returns for all the time series. Again, interactive visualization, making use of cufflinks. And cufflinks gives us the nice iplot functionality, right? So instead of plot with a data frame, we have iplot. Then the heat map for the correlations. Um, you see the VIX is pretty correlated with too many instruments there. So also an easy visualization, easy in a sense of you just have this one method call, right? You calculate the correlations and you have one method call and this gives you an interactive heat map here. So the approach of the efficient market story here is that we use lagged price data, lagged price data, let's say seven historical lags. And we do it for all the instruments. And when we have a look here, uh, the Apple data, this is the Apple price, and this is yesterday's price, uh, two days before, three days before, four days, so four lag price data. Uh, and when we implement ordinarily squares regression on that, I do it here for all the instruments at the same time. What we see here is that given our regression results, we have here like all the weight of the regression on the first lag. So just today's price seems to be relevant to predict or based on ordinarily squares regression, tomorrow's price, right? We can combine this for a little bit of a visualization, and here we see it much easier. So lag number one has a value of roughly two, uh, close to one, and all the others all pretty close to one. When I do the average, it's even more pronounced lag one, and all the others are like unimportant, like one makes the show. And uh, again, this is what the efficient market or random walk hypothesis says. The best predictor of tomorrow's price is today. So, and this is what we see here in the, in the data reflected. There's, there are a couple of caveats here with regard to how I apply uh, OLS regression. We violate, for example, certain exemptions of, of um, ordinarily squares regression. We have, for example, a high degree of collinearity uh, between the, the uh, independent variables, but this is just for illustration. This is nothing that we use for any trading or whatnot. With stats model, it's just another package. Stats model gives you like a nice overview of all the parameters um, and the statistics, like the F statistic here is pretty high, so the model has a, a proper explanatory power. Lag number one has a p-value of here zero, at least to the third digit, and all the others have a p-value above 5%. So that's kind of like, you know, what you can do in this regard. And efficient markets are something that we discuss um, at least at some length, um, at some length um, in the AI and finance class and the algo trading class. So there are a couple, a couple of places uh, where efficient markets obviously play a role. So in computational finance, we make use of efficient markets in the sense of that we assume in computational finance, in, in financial engineering, in option pricing, that the market is always right. And when we see like prices of stocks in the market, we say, well, the market is right. I don't have a business in trying to doubt that the market um, is right. And this is how derivatives pricing starts as well. We take, for example, the stock price as an input for valuation, right? And here I use the model, Merton uh, 76, that's the starting model in the computational finance class. 
after the standard, the, the benchmark, Flex Gold's Merton class. And this has a jump diffusion component, right? And in this context, in the computational finance context, efficient markets are our friend. Friend in the sense that we use them to calibrate our model to the market. So this means based on least squares considerations, we try to minimize the mean squared error or here the square root of the mean squared error um, of the option prices of the model given the market prices that we face, right? Here I work with option pricing data and there's like quite a few of them and these are the original examples from the book. And this is where the, these are the, the options that I use for the calibration. And this is where the calibration takes no place. We have a bunch of parameters. We also talk about degrees of freedom in this context. And we try now to come up with parameter values that best replicate the option prices in the market. So here we are like on the side of the efficient markets. We, we, we make friends with efficient markets. We say, well, the market knows what's going on and what's, what's a right price for this option and our model should listen to the market and we try to make the model replicate the market prices in the best possible fashion. We first do here in this little example, a brute force optim optimization and do afterwards then after the brute force is finished, we do a local optimization. Something that I do regularly for all these models. First, like the Superman approach, second, like going deeper, right? Flying high and when we are finished with the brute force, the high level optimization, then we go to local optimization, right? And then we have here the error function with the outputs. And when I generate the plot, here we go. Yeah, we see, <laughs> if, we just, if we just see the upper subplot, this looks almost perfect, right? But of course, there are differences, right? So this looks perfect. Uh, the call prices are the blue line and the model prices are the red dots. And we see the differences are not too large, but they are like one, um, these are Euro stocks options, one Euro in absolute terms, minus, uh, not really close to one Euro here, plus one Euro again and minus 1.5 Euro uh, for the most right here. So, um, and you see it um, seems to be an unbiased estimator that we get from the model because we have both positive as well as negative derivations. This is something that we would like to have. So this is what calibration is about. We make friends with efficient markets. We say the market is always right and our model is to be calibrated in a way that the model best replicates what we see in the markets. So that's the calibration story. With DX analytics, just like a quick run through. So we, we go through this package, which has become pretty powerful over time with regard to modeling. Here we do some modeling of risk factors. In the beginning, it's simple stuff in terms of geometric Brownian motion, Black Scholes Merton. So all, all these concepts, for example, if you say, well, what, what is jump to what is jump to what is geometric brown emotion these are reviewed in the finance with python class in a, in a rather simple setup so that you uh, get if at all for the first time then confronted with it in a gentle uh, more slow setup so to say but here we apply now the hopefully built up knowledge at that point and use like dx analytics to do simulation here a couple of paths just visualized then we have another Simulation here with a little bit of a higher volatility. Then we set up our valuation models for, here you see an American put option, calculate present values, the numerical creeks. And with DX analytics, although this is a American option, I can calculate and estimate, I'd rather say, the creeks as if I would have a analytical formula. The second derivative is now a European one, the more simple case. And you see here all the creeks. I put them together into an options portfolio, two derivatives positions, risk factors, 
the portfolio itself. Oh, 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 oh. oh I'm using here in some place. I use probably some, um, I need to maybe update it. Um, you see, this has been depreciated. Series doesn't have uh, an index anymore. Uh, let me see where it is. Uh, things change so quickly over time. Um, yeah, I need to look uh, in the in the in the code. Uh, I can't can't do it now on the fly. For the um, I executed it on a different machine before when I tested it, and there it worked. So I need to update here my installation. So this is about the X analytics. Uh, again, this is not about numbers that you see here. I just wanted to show you the uh, the, the single topics. Uh, these two examples are computational finance related and this is the part where we where we uh, uh, yeah how I like to put it make friends with efficient markets right so that's this particular part but in algorithmic trading and now we come to market prediction the efficient markets hypothesis is our enemy because when we try to predict the market movements better than a baseline algorithm like a 50-50 baseline algorithm, yeah, we pretend, we assume that we can beat the market, that we are better than the market, right? In computational finance, we say the market is always right. In algorithmic trading, we say, well, market might be all right, but we can maybe a little bit better. So a little bit better than a passive benchmark investment. And here is a simple prediction example. Again, the details are all um, covered. Uh, Simple prediction example here based on Wanda data for the euro yes dollar. And this makes use of a bunch of features here for the machine learning algorithm, like the difference between high and low and uh, volatility measure, simple moving average, momentum feature. So it's a, it's a mix of different features that are used here to create a prediction, right? I have training and um, test data, also some validation data that I make use of. I use 10 lakhs, Gaussian normalization. Here I pre-process the data, normalize and lag, length of columns. I have 210 feature columns in total. This results from the features that I define plus the lags that I do, right? So it's, uh, we work with lag features here in this context. Not, for, not every feature is normalized, so this is the differentiation, but we lag the features accordingly. This gives a total of 210 columns, right? And then we apply a deep neural network here, an MLP classifier. Um, it's just one of the models that we cover in detail, right? So I, here I could have worked with, let's say, Keras, TensorFlow, but scikit-learn gives us like a nice um, class here, MLP classifier. That's, um, that's also usually pretty fast. You see here 2.6 seconds for our data with the 210 feature columns. So that's quite a bit already. And when I do the vectorized backtesting now, the question is whether my prediction has any value in it. And at this stage, we would put value on it when we see some statistical inefficiency. This means that we, with our predictions, are able to beat the market, right? If the market, let's say, makes plus 10%, there wouldn't be a big point in having a model that gives you plus 5%, right? But maybe there's a point in having a model which gives you plus 20%. Um, of course, risk plays a role, but since we are dealing here with long and short only strategies, the, the, the risk as expressed as a volatility, standard deviation, is uh, basically the same. So let's do the prediction and see what we can do. And here we have the first numbers. So based on our euro yes dollar data from Wanda, we have a base return here of minus 3.3% and we have plus 4.8% for the strategy. We have, however, 566 trades, all this again in detail in the respective class. And you see we have mostly short positions, but also quite a bunch of long positions. And when I visualize this, you see here that we have um, the green line, which is the strategy line. 
and we have the blue one, which is the, the investment. So the performance of the benchmark investment is uh, not too surprising. We are dealing here with the euro, yes, dollar. And uh, I obviously picked here a stretch where the euro, yes, dollar has declined. So the quote for the euro, yes, dollar uh, currency pair has declined quite a bit. So, but our machine learning based algorithm is able to predict not all the movements, for sure not, but several movements here correct. And uh, it's better, obviously, than uh, a baseline predictor, which would get 50% uh, only correct. So the outperformance here is a bunch of uh, uh, percentage points. Here are the numbers, uh, some three plus uh, some, some, let's say 7% to keep it simple. And if you would leverage that, this could theoretically lead to a plus 70% outperformance, but I'm not considering any transaction costs or whatnot here. So this is just to start. Therefore, I speak here of a statistical inefficiency. If we add costs to the mix, then we are closer to economic inefficiency, but this is not addressed here. So here we try to beat the market by using algorithms for prediction. The efficient market is our enemy and not the friend anymore. If we want to, um, if we want to exploit this, I just show one of the two that I have here, but you have access to the two. We need the platform, right? Now we say, well, we have done all our research, everything has gone well, um, and um, at least in theory, in my Jupyter lab notebook, everything has gone well. Now I want to try and, and deploy my algorithm in practice, right? And this is now. Uh, based on Wanda, where a more simple strategy is used. And uh, the more simple strategy is based on uh, just momentum. I use here a one minute bar data. It's a little bit older here, you see, but I can replicate this with other time frames as well. Um, uh, this is based on 1,418 one minute bars for euro yes dollar. So the instrument is the same, but it's now a different story data-wise, right? And also strategy-wise. The momentum strategy, I use a rolling window of six bars. This is now six minutes total length as my momentum measure. And I say, well, I want to be long when the momentum is positive and short when it is negative, right? So it's the momentum idea here in the context of time series momentum. The hit ratio we can calculate you see false true true whenever we get the, the the direction correct we see a true whenever we get the direction wrong we get a false here so the hits are like uh here the true hits are just six 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 versus seven four six falses so we have a hit ratio of 47 percent this is less than a 50 percent baseline that we would expect in general but Vectorized backtesting, same what we did before, shows that the hit ratio is only one side of the coin. If we get the larger movements correct, then obviously, again, we might discover here a statistical inefficiency. That's, a, that's why I like the example, right? We have less than 50% hit ratio, but nevertheless, statistically, before transaction costs, an outperformance. We have 259 trades, so transaction costs are probably considerable. And you see here, like trades are taking place at a relatively high frequency. I would call this mid frequency. It's not high frequency HFT, but it's mid frequency, right? It changes uh, the position quite often intraday, right? So when we want to place trades, we need the platform. Here, for example, I create an order, and you see the um, order object, which is given back. It's a JSON object. I went long Euro GBP 100 units, and now I go short 100 units. So this is for a test account that you can open for free. And uh, this is, in particular, when we all get started with that stuff, we should make sure that we don't risk real money. Um, when we are... Um, sure that we have something robust and reliable, then we can easily switch to um, um, real trading because the APIs for the paper trading account and the real trading account are basically the same. So here, print transactions, and I can 
now it's back to see here my uh, two trades. Um, maybe I don't need like so many, like 40, for example. These have been all the trades a while back. Euro yes dollar. Now I have uh, the two Euro GBP trades that have been placed at these times. And I see like the PL. I lost a little bit. Also, with a paper trading account, I get access to streaming data as well. So here I stream in real time now seven ticks with bit ask and the exact timestamp, right? So that's the vehicle, the infrastructure, the platform that we need to implement our strategies. The last but not least, like um, the reinforcement learning example. And it's not actually reinforcement learning. I, sh I, I didn't show you like the Q learning algorithm, um, but I show you now the game. You recall, I showed you video recordings of two games. The one was the mountain car. The other one was the lunar land. And here is like the introductory example. It's the card pole one, right? And this is a very simple one. I use it as a starting point and I also use it as a blueprint to transfer the DQL agent's learning to a financial space. So that's the reason why I really love this example, because we can use this as, as a frame, as a blueprint, and model the financial market according to the environment. But more on this in the, on that in the reinforcement learning class and also in the, in the manuscript of AI and finance. We have two actions that we can take, here two. Here's a sample action, another sample action, one more. It's all ones, all ones. There must be some zero. Now it's the first zero. This is like randomized. The zero means move to the left and move to the right is a one for the card pull game. So you will know immediately when you see the picture of it, what is meant by all that. Observation space, four values here with the high values, the low values. And when I do a reset, I get a state which is randomized, card position, card velocity, pole angle, pole angular velocity. So four parameters describe my world. Now I can take an action, randomized. With an action, I step forward in time by one step. This gives me a new state. And now there comes the visualization of such a random agent. And here you see the visualization. And this is the card. The black thing is the card. The, the brown, I don't know, beige thing is the, is the pole. And the problem of this game is to balance the pole upright on the card. And you only have two actions. You can put it to the right or you can uh, or push it. And you can push it to the left. So it's a classical balancing problem. You only have two actions. And the world here, the game is described by four parameters. And I can rerun this, but since I'm working with a random agent, eh, sometimes it survives a little bit longer. Now it died after 24 steps. And you are successful when you survive 200 steps. So now let us come up with a better solution. Dimensionality reduction here. Um, we have four parameters. And here I use random weights to trim them down to just one parameter. So from four parameters to one parameter. Here we have the four original ones. Based on a dot product and my weights, I arrive at a single parameter, right? The S parameter. And this is here not really required, but I just want to illustrate that this is a typical approach in reinforcement learning because when you want to train an agent on a more complex world, then sometimes the world is too complex to be modeled explicitly, right? Therefore, you need to reduce dimensionality to the most important features elements, right? And my action policy is now if S is negative, I move it to the left. And if S is positive, I move it to the right. So A would be here one because S is positive. Now, the learning objective is to learn weights that allow the agent to survive 200 steps. My episode here is modeled by this function. And when I run the episode here with my original weights, oh, you see it only survives 10 steps, 9, 10. So this is not a good one, right? My first weights are not good. So let's now Monte Carlo sample weights that 
at least once get to 200 steps. So, and these are candidate weights. If they are good or not, I don't know. We test them a hundred times and the average is 154. This is not good because the, the agent is considered successful if it reaches an average score of 195 or above over 100 consecutive games. So this is a, an okay agent with my weights, but it's not a good one. It's not one that is successful. So let's try another one. Uh, it's also not good. So today is like, ah, uh, now we have an agent. These weights here, these weights are now weights that are not only leading to a okay or good agent, this leads now to a perfect agent. You see, I run it 100 times and I get an average score of 200. This means I solve the problem, the game here, perfectly 100 times in a row. Now I use this agent and this agent will now run to 200, right? So, and I can run it again. And here, let me, yeah, so it's running. You see it's survived 200, but let me get away with that one. But I have, I can visualize it. When I run it here, you have now the agent which balances the pole and keeps it upright. So it doesn't need to survive a thousand steps. It's just 200 steps. And this is what we have shown you. And this finishes also my, um, this example here. Yeah, this was a quick run through um, certain topics, reinforcement class, uh, computational finance class, a power algo class, AI class. So just like I picked a couple of topics that I consider um, interesting there. So, we have basically covered all the classes and I said, well, because most of that stuff here is algo trading related. I did the case studies first, but we have seen already the stuff from computational finance and the computational finance classes, market-based valuation, complete models, risk neutral valuation, Fourier pricing, uh, theory and applications, American options, general market model, Monte Carlo simulation, calibration hedging, review and practice, and all is not all is, I just want to say all is based on numerics only. It's not. Uh, there's, of course, lots of theory in there, but the focus lies on the coding on the numerical side, where you see like efficient implementations of, uh, let's say, Monte Carlo schemes for stochastic volatility models and all these elements that are so important. Also, uh, similar routines to the ones that I have demoed today for the calibration of option pricing models, not only the Merton one, but also ones including stochastic volatility and other elements, hatching based on numerical method. So methods, that, that's kind of like a full-fledged program based to a large extent on my book, Derivatives Analytics with Python. But you have access not only on the platform to the codes. As I said, every book that is published has, has its GitHub repo. Feel free to go there as well. So uh, codes have been updated to Python 3.6. They should work on Python 3.7 as well. And with DX Analytics, we have the Python package <laughs> that I have written myself. <laughs> Obviously, uh, here I have tried to implement all the stuff that you find in the, uh, in the book, but much, much more. So uh, implementation-wise, there's much more than is covered in the book, and you can do much more, for example, um, yeah, which is not covered at all in the book, uh, value complex portfolios of derivatives or um, to have uh, derivatives which have multi-risk. This is also not covered in the book, for example. Um, calibration, of course, can be done here as before. So it's, it's a pretty flexible derivatives with a focus, I must confess, on equity derivatives modeling library, right? And it's also, although it uses um, mostly numerical methods for pricing risk management, et cetera, also for the numerics, it's still pretty fast. So when I started implementing it, um, it took quite a while for single operations, but with modern hardware, uh, also it makes use of the backend to some extent of parallelization. Um, it's kind of has like a decent performance, even on a local machine. I'm not talking about like a cluster with like a 
1024 nodes. So this works pretty well and give it a try. And I know that it's used around the world, but since it's open source, I don't know exactly who uses it, uh, but a bunch of uh, companies and, and I got in touch uh, a while ago with people from the SEC that use it for some specific purpose. I don't know what, they just had technical questions and quite a few more that make use of the package. Of course, it's it's full, fully documented. It's all on the web. Feel free to look there as well. But we go through the single steps there um, in the class, of course, as well. So um, you have access on the web, but uh, your primary source probably will be our platform with the single sources. The basic idea is that we have Monte Carlo simulation of cash flows and optimal exercise policy and risk neutral discounting backwards. So we have multiple risk factors, maybe multi-risk derivatives. We have non-redundant modeling. We speak of positions and portfolios where we take care of the net payoffs and it's uh, all about risk neutral discounting. So the fundamental theorem of asset pricing here is in full action. We can have constant deterministic or stochastic short rates. It's, it's pretty pretty flexible what we can do. It's for risk neutral present values, creeks for instruments, single positions and portfolios composed of yeah, potentially complex other uh, derivative instruments. Again, such a pyramid here, we have eight layers, infrastructure, financial data, model simulation, free pricing, calibration, market valuation, and hedging. And given what we have discussed, this should by now be clear, but this is repeated, of course, uh, a couple of times in the class itself. So the study plan you have access to, read carefully through the guidelines there. And um, here, this is the plan itself. So for the first week, finance with Python, is what gets you started one and two you should read chapters one to three um updated at least to some extent not everything and they are updated but to some extent uh, some errors have been corrected etc we have today our intro and overview session then data types and structures is the starting point in the financial data science class tools and skills one and ai and finance was chapter one and pi excel so this is here you see the the, the red frame what you're supposed to cover in the first week. So if you say, well, it's already quite a bit of workload. For example, this is what I pointed out. You can move, for example, the, the tools and skills part to a little bit later start when you say, well, um, I work on platform 2.0, give it a try with Jupyter Lab. You should be able to execute everything that is shown here, all the resources on the platform. Excel, for example, is the exception, right? So. Um, we cannot provide functionality that you use the Excel wings and Excel on the platform. This is something that you need to uh, do locally because you simply need an Excel desktop application running locally in order to follow along this particular class. So that's, that's uh, given by the technology. Yeah, and so we move on. You have received the first orientation email, which basically repeats what you see here which gives you further guidelines. Feel free to uh, reach out um, via the user forum for the technical questions uh, that you have. So don't hesitate. Don't get stuck for like hours and end. Uh, rather reach out. Try to be as um, concise as possible and as complete as possible. So I come to that in a minute. It's the second but last part there, right? You have review questions, exercises, and text test projects. I will put these into the column. You see it here, live and tutorials. There you will see recommendations and like uh, guidelines for the um, tutorials um, because they should start next week. In the first week, you should get started gently and with the materials. And from next week on, you will uh, be presented with uh, not the review questions. They typically come after week three, the first set. They are more with regard to the understanding, but the test exercises and test projects, they are really like to code, right? Here you see a typical example, pretty close to what you see in the original materials. And the test project might be a little bit out or beyond of what we have covered uh, before. So they should, um, they should challenge you a bit. So don't... <sighs> Don't worry too much if it's maybe too hard. Maybe you can uh, push them off to a later point. Um, so, but the exercise at least should be tried. There is a question whether um, Open Office or LibreOffice can be substituted for Excel, and that's a clear no. So, this whole thing 
Excel wings and the interaction relies on the infrastructure, .NET, et cetera, of, um, of Excel, of the Office Suite, the, this is not a replacement. But be interested in, I mean, there are like real, which means like legal licenses for, for Office that you can download, for example, from German um, uh, platforms that are second market, second hand licenses, they come with a price tag, let's say, I don't know, 20 euro or below. Um, and this is what I use as well. They are fully legal. It's like, say, a regulated environment. And you can use then Excel. So for, if you're interested in this part, I would recommend that you um, get like a proper license, which is then not only for Excel, which is then for the whole Office suite as well in this regard. Yeah, the only exam for the to get the certificate is the final project. That's correct. Um, that's correct. Uh, but you should, of course, carefully do the other exercise and test projects as well. They lead you then on the path to the final project. In addition, also, of course, to the practice modules later. User forum is your friend. I've shown you the user forum. Make use daily, whatever you like. Put your stuff in there. Uh, maybe it's not within the first hour that you get like an answer. But uh, if you follow the rules, and this is like, please, 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 please read carefully through this post there from Stack Overflow, how to create a minimal, complete, and verifiable example. There are so many instances that we had on the user forum where I say, well, I'm so sorry, I cannot help, although I would really love to. When people say, oh, listen, Eve, there was like uh, lesson three in the AI and finance class, minute 55, you do X, Y, that. I tried to exactly replicate it on my machine, but it doesn't work. Can you help? I mean, you know how, how I put it, right? And uh, I don't have any specific post in the back of my head, but we have had so many. Um, please follow the lines here. Have a look at the forum and you see like every second post has my comment and the link to this post. Try to come up with a minimal, which means use as little code as possible that still produces the same problem. Uh, with a complete example, provide all the parts needed to reproduce the problem in the question itself. For example, data set. If you're working with a data set and have a problem, if you don't provide us with a data set, we hardly can do anything there, right? Verifiable, test that the code that you are about to provide, uh, make sure that it reproduces the problem. And there, this post has a quite a bit more, but the three guides, guidelines here uh, yeah, summarize it pretty well. Um, oh, there's somebody asking about the, the site. I, from the back of my head, you should give it a try here. This is in German, but if you, maybe there's an English version at L, it's called Rakuten, the E, that's, that's the site where I have bought, let's say, Windows 10 professional licenses and also uh, several offens, uh, office licenses for my different uh, machines on which uh, I or we in the company uh, make use of that. So it's Rakuten, the E, this is um, where I put it. Um, yeah, there, there's somebody pointing out that they do it in the US, and I know there have been quite a couple of legal battles. Michael, uh, Microsoft wanted to um, yeah, prevent people from doing that, but they lost it because, uh, I mean, this is a license that they got money for, and people should be allowed to trade these licenses. And this is the same as if you are buying, let's say, a MacBook, and uh, I don't want to use the MacBook anymore. And I go to a second-hand hardware page and I can put it up for sale for sure, right? And uh, why should Apple come along and say, no, 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 no. You are not allowed to um, sell your Apple MacBook. Uh, this is what you bought and uh, we don't allow you to sell it. This is strange, right? But this is exactly what Microsoft tried to do. Uh, they tried to prevent, uh, for obvious reasons, um, secondary markets in these license keys. So this, this is a story. I cannot point you at this uh, moment to, to proper sources there, but this is the story that I can tell uh, about the background there. They lost quite a few legal um, cases in this regard. So how to create a minimal, complete, and verifiable example. This should become your Bible and major guideline there. The importance of practice, my final point, when you look at how people are trained in the professional and business worlds, you find the tendency to focus on knowledge at the expense of skills. 
I would say reading a Python book doesn't make you a Python programmer. In the same way that reading a book about playing the piano doesn't make you a piano player. Nor, I don't know, I, you get the point, I can continue until the end of the day. Um, I believe the best approach will be to develop skills-based trainings programs. And this is what guides me from the beginning. Although we only have one class, which is called tools and skills, basically all the classes are about skills, right? See it that way, practice it um, every once in a while, sit down, try to replicate stuff from the back of your head, download a data file, process the data, visualize the data, work with it, play around with it as, as if you would uh, try a new instrument, right? You, you, you sit down and you practice, right? And this is what you should be, do here as well. So training should focus on doing, rather than on knowing. So if you know 10 things really well, this is, um, uh, uh, if you have, yeah, this, let's say 10 different skills, whatever this might be, uh, and they are well, worse, well, flash, right? It's better than to have heard about 100 different things that you could learn someday in the future. So see it that, see it that way. If you have limited time, Focus on a few things and try to make the, to do them really well. Focus on pandas and try to master pandas data frame, let's say. That's a good thing to do. And at the same time, on any array object. And there are so many things around it, but if you master that, this brings you pretty far. But there is <laughs> yeah, there's one, one good thing about this whole thing. Basically, what this says here is that there are no born innate, innately talented people out there, right? No matter which area you study, this is all from the book uh, Peak by, by Anders Ericsson. Uh, no matter which area you study, music, dance, sports, competitive games, or anything else with objective measures of performance, you find that the top performers have devoted a tremendous amount of time to developing their abilities. This means two things. That whenever you see somebody at the Python conference and doing some live coding at light speed, probably this guy has done Python coding for years and maybe it's coded some other languages. But this also means that you should not expect spending one hour a week and to be proficient in the field after four weeks, right? Here, yes, you read it. The best ones have put in tremendous amount of time. The good ones, probably a decent amount of time. So you decide for yourself how good you want to become, how much time you invest and it will pay off. Be assured. And this is what I like to conclude since quite a while. So this was one of my favorite quotes because this is what I want to achieve with this program. Not that I, you know, preach the gospel here. No, I, Elvis here, he was like from a cohort 2017 until beginning 2018. He said, I liked watching your videos. Sure, you should do it. Also reading the text. But it's much more interesting and educational to actually build something on my own. And we all know that. If we do something on our own and it's running in the end, this is basically this is basically uh, what we enjoy, what gives us enjoyment, right? When we get into the flow, when we are fully immersed in what we do, and when it works afterwards, this is what you should strive for, right? Listen to what I have to say, what I have written down, what we have compiled for you, but you should sit down and do it on your own. And this will give you the highest amount of in enjoyment. Um, yeah, there's somebody asking when you started with the um, ALGO certificate or computational finance certificate and you want to uh, upgrade later on to the platinum package, that's for sure possible. Just reach out by email and um, then we uh, for sure find a solution for that. That's, um, uh, that's for sure. You can do it anytime. So if you say, well, I've just signed up for the Algo one, but what he showed with regard to computational finance might be interesting as well. I mean, if you reach out and I'm, I'm sure we can set you up for tomorrow, let's say, so that you have access to everything. If this is your decision, I'm not pressing anybody, but of course we are, um, we are flexible in this regard. <clears throat> Yeah, we, there's somebody asking about risk management. We cover, for example, in the Python for financial data science, um, uh, risk stuff. We, um, so value at risk in particular is covered there uh, based on normal distributions, based on distributions with jumps, et cetera. We cover risk management, algo trading. So now I'm in the risk measure 
uh, a business in terms of like trading stop loss, backtesting, take profit, um, stop loss. And so risk you find in all corners, but it's not a risk management program per se. But uh, for example, in the Monte Carlo parts, et cetera, risk always uh, plays a role. <laughs> There's somebody asking whether we whether we do trading um, uh, ourselves. Yes, the, the AI machine is, is basically an internal project. I have it on the platform on our website, I'd rather say, but this is for us to walk the talk. So we do trading, I go trading ourselves. Um, and whether I prefer teaching over trading, <laughs> I mean, currently teaching is one of my, my major things, obviously, but the, the um, AI machine is an outgrowth of that teaching. So. Of course, I'm interested in it, but I, if you ask me currently in terms of percentage-wise, I would say, well, it's more like 80% teaching and writing and content creation, but this all leads to what we do on the trading side, right? And I have a, contrary to the teaching side, which I mostly do myself, uh, we have a dedicated team which works on with the AI machine and takes care of that, I wouldn't say 24 hours, but <laughs> all week, all month, and all year, right? So that's that's a little bit of a difference. That's like a separate that's a separate team. So uh, whether we are successful in algo trading, oh, well, I could uh, tell long stories. We are still like testing so many things. Sometimes we are pretty successful, sometimes not so, but um, we just recently started trading real money. So uh, I wouldn't speak of a track record. We had like stretches, which have been pretty, pretty good. Uh, making 20% plus in your US dollar on a weekly basis, um, trading BCO. BCO was, um, French crude oil, US dollar was kind of a fantastic thing until the beginning of the year, the crisis. Before we had like a strategy that we ran there for um, uh, like from the beginning of the year until the crisis hit, which was uh, well above 100%, then the signal didn't work anymore at all. So we stopped it completely for a while. We will now get back to that. So, But I can't speak of a track record. Therefore, I wouldn't say we are successful or not. So this is simply too um, not too long in, in this context. But I must confess, if you ask me openly, that I'm currently too immersed in writing the books and finishing the books and doing the teaching. So... Uh, I wouldn't say it's half-heartedly, but I simply have, like everybody else, only 24-7 and writing books is something that I do on my own. I cannot really delegate. But the infrastructure is there. It's all there to uh, be scaled. And uh, I'm pretty happy about the product that we have put together in this regard. And I'm also excited and happy about our certificate program. I hope you are as well. So therefore, you should get started this week. Um, it's already quite a bit to do. Uh, I wish you happy Python coding. And in these days, um, for sure, take care, stay safe. And I see you in the next session. You have all the platforms, all the venues where you can ask your questions, put your stuff, your code, where you have particular technical questions and user forum, et cetera, organization questions by email. Feel free to reach out at any time. Have a good start. I see you in the next session. Bye-bye.